exactly. And and kind of with that, I mean, maybe share some perspective on how how customers have changed over the last thirty years. Like, I mean, you've been in the additive space for a while now. You've seen improvements in the technology. You've seen companies come and go. You've seen kind of production go into place in, in many different organizations and industries. Like, what are your kind of general observations over that time? Yeah. Oh, man, that's that's been a huge change over the years. You know, uh, you know, way back, you know, geez, 25 years. 28, somewhere in there years ago, um, customers had no clue what was going on in 3D printing, right? Like, I mean, some of the funny stories I have around that are, uh, you know, um, I when we used to make SLA parts, they were so brittle and fragile that uh, I literally would hand deliver parts um, and I would show up, you know, and of course they reach out to grab the part and I'd be like, oh, hang on, hang on, where do you want this to sit? And they're like, what do you mean? Just let me have my hand up. You can't grab this. Like, I'm going to set it where it belongs. <laughs> You're not going to touch it. Leave it alone because you even look at it wrong. It'll break. Right. Uh, and and to, to answer your question, you know, customers just didn't know. They, they didn't know what to expect. They didn't know how it works. Heck, we didn't even know how it works. Right. And it was changing and growing rapidly. And, um, and so, you know, the biggest change that's happened over the years with customers is the, the, the knowledge change. Um, so back then they didn't really have an idea. So it was a really hard sale. Um, but it became easy because there was just this magic that could happen, you know, for the tooling world, uh, injection molding was the biggest area for that, right? Like, um, it was so expensive to, to go through the process of injection molding back then because design iteration meant you had to make all new tools, right? And that's really what made 3D printing so successful was the ability to visualize, hold in your hand the part that you're gonna make without tooling, right? So you don't have to go through injection molding and do all that tooling. You can make the part, feel it, see it. Um, and what we found was as a world, and you can see a lot of the change in technology that's happened, not just with 3D printing, but you know, cell phones and all kinds of things that have developed, um, it's all around people being able to visualize things. I mean, if you think about it, humans want to be able to see and feel what they're thinking about. So you look at like VR technology and things like that. That's all, I mean, all these things about being able to program in space and grab it, and pull it, and move it. You know, that's all people wanting to be able to visualize. And 3D printing made that a possibility, right? Like you could take your cat and be able to print it in a few days, visualize it, feel it, hold it. Um, and so knowledge base is what changed, you know, I mean, go 10 years forward from that, you know, it started to be customers um, knew how to specify what they wanted. You know, back then we were teaching and training and pulling them along. And then they got to the point where they knew what FDM was. They knew what SLS was. They knew what SLA was. Um, so they were able to start helping us specify. But where the gaps were is they didn't understand the materials. Right. So um, you were constantly running into this problem of like, oh, yeah, just anything plastic, uh, then it wasn't hard enough and it wasn't high heat enough. And, you know, they would put it in their trunk expecting it to be like an injection molded part. And it was, you know, warped like crazy and flat. And now it doesn't work. Um, you know, <laughs> horror stories like you wouldn't believe that I've been through. Um, you know, 15 years, you know, here comes metal. Metal starts to come out and, um, you know, now you have companies that know what they're doing, right? Now you have the Honeywells, the Boeings, the Lockheed, you know, those types of companies that have the engineering staff and the science, the material science behind it, you know, that they started to play a real active part. Um, you know, I mean, in, in direct metal, you know, direct metal EOS, you know, brought that on board as a way to prototype metal parts. You know, as I was talking about that, to be able to visualize, well, that, that, that want to be able to visualize better and more was, well, yeah, that's great. I can make a plastic part of my eventual metal part, but that doesn't really help me do anything. And so making parts out of metal was what EOS made possible, right? So now you have the metal parts and, you know, but that was all just prototyping. They really didn't envision that this was going to become production viable. In fact, there were companies, you know, on the level of Honeywell that would that got on stage and said, we're never going to make rotating parts. It's never going to happen. We're never going to use 3D printing for, you know, any of these mission critical applications. But look today, 
you know, SpaceX is building their rockets out of, you know, metal additive, you know, relativity space is printing an entire rocket, you know, I mean, so all the mission critical applications, that's all been debunked, right? Like, I mean, we're now we understand that, yeah, we can use this. And it wasn't but 10 years ago that people were saying that. Um, so the knowledge base, like I said, that's what's changed, you know, and those companies have been involved. And now it's to the point where we're really digging deep. Now it's in, you know, in situ monitoring and the software that, that we're using to, to better ourselves. Uh, and customers are all part of that. Customers are writing the specifications today, you know, of what powder to use, what machines to use. So they're really actively involved. Um, and I think, you know, next step, you know, there's a lot of people in this industry who that bothers, right? It's hard to do work. Like if you look at CNC machining, the customers aren't that actively involved in like what machine you're going to use or how you're going to go about your paths. You know, they, they don't do that. Well, that's because the competence level in that technology has gotten to the point where they don't need to be anymore. Um, but additive isn't there yet, right? We're, we all want to hurry and make that the case. But the reality is it's just time. You know, it's the customers need to, that knowledge transfer that has been happening for the last 30 years is that progression that we need. And I think we're probably within 10 years from being able to start being machine agnostic and, you know, the customers not being so actively involved, you know, it gets to the point, there's many customers that are now designing and putting it on a print to say, you know, printed Inconel 718, you know, he treated this way, go, you know, and they're hands off from that point on. Um, and so, you know, that's starting. And, and I think we're, you know, five to 10 years away from, it'll be just like CNC. Like, here's my print, make my part. You know, we're not going to be all up in your business. Just just make things, um, you know. But yeah, it's definitely the knowledge base of the, of the customer base that's changed over the years and, and their appreciation and understanding of the process and the technology.